Hello, welcome back to I Got Board Game. I got board game. I got board game. <laughs> I'm Ben. I'm John. And today we're here actually just for a first impressions video. First impression. <laughs> Did not expect that. First like impression guy. video with John. Yes. And because recently we I got to play and show him a game for the first time uh, and it was a big game took us i think probably like to learn and play like two and a half hours two and a half hours yep yeah yeah but it was great finally getting to play this heavy game and that game is brass brass birmingham you can see the big box and the nice gilding on the letters mm -hmm. brass birmingham published by roxley games uh, which have done like Steampunk Rally and Santorini. The Brass Birmingham was on Kickstarter a few years ago and is designed by Matt Tolman, Gavin Brown, and the big name Martin Wallace, who is really big in the industry for doing Euro games for a long time. Uh, and he actually did the original Brass. And so this version was kind of a uh, newer version that he did on the Kickstarter. There was Brass Lancashire, which was a remake of the original Brass. And then this one had a couple other people uh, helping him design a little, a little more advanced version of Brass. And so we have Brass Birmingham. And the box says it plays two to four players, one to two hours, which is about right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, it's a heavy Euro game uh and we're gonna get john's first impressions on this i played it a few more times than him so i'm kind of uh ready to get into a re review later on after john gets to play it a couple more times mm -hmm. uh get his thoughts on it a little more uh but before we get into the first impressions again as a first impressions video we're not gonna do our usual overview of the game but i will do an even shorter summary uh just in case there's certain obviously mechanics or points that John will want to bring up or comment on uh, just to kind of give you a general idea of the theme then and some of the things to be aware of in the game. And so the theme is basically you're competing as entrepreneurs in England's industrial revolution in the 18th to 19th century. Uh, I think it's 1770 to 1870. And so the game is like, like I mentioned, a one to two hour game because it has two main halves or phases. Uh, the first is the canal era. And then afterwards is the rails era, basically when you know they were transporting things by canals to later on using coal, uh, coal uh, trains and rails. And so the game plays basically, each player has their own board of industry tiles, which, you know, are like cotton mills, manufactured goods, pottery, and stuff like that, that they're trying to build in certain cities on the board. And as they get to play cards that represent those cities or industries, that's what allows them to build those. And as they're building those, they can eventually, they will be using resources from other people. And so that's one of the main things you'll notice in some of the pictures. There's basically resources like coal and iron and beer, which uh, as you start building up your networks, because there is route building in the game, uh, you'll need to use these resources, whether they belong to you or other people to build your industry onto the board. And so as you use up those resources, tiles can flip, these industry tiles can flip. That's how those players will eventually get points. Mm -hmm. It'll also grant them uh, income. And so there is kind of an income track in the game too, aside from a victory point track, which then uh, you'll be getting income every round, depending on how high up you are on that track. So there's a lot of this resource management of, can I link up the resources to build some industry I need? Will I get to flip my own or flip someone else's for points and income? And then how much income am I getting to be able to continue building these industries? So there's that cycle of resource management going on. And so while John gets into his first impressions, um, I mean, maybe ask for his pros and then cons also, but the order doesn't really matter, whatever 
you're more comfortable with John since yeah. it's your first impressions. Uh, while he's doing that, I'll kind of just share some pictures on the screen of the different components in the game. Yeah, thanks so much, Ben. Uh, so starting off as a first impressions, I think the simplest and the easiest thing to talk about in my first playthrough is just starting out when you open the box and you open the board and you see like what is it that you're seeing so when you open it uh, I, I think ben actually has the deluxe edition of this game mm -hmm. so it's not maybe the base one or not the, the one that you'll get if you buy it out in stores nowadays or at least if you don't get access to to the deluxe but when you open the box you can already tell and even in the outside of the box you can tell this is really high quality artwork uh even my wife had uh, mentioned as soon as we brought the game out she was like "Ooh, this is really pretty and this is really nice it looks really really good right and you can tell based on just the artwork and what they put into the game all of the components all the pieces you can clearly tell they put a lot of effort and a lot of care into the coloring into kind of the thematic sense of you know, the, the 1770s into the 1800s of that industrial era, coal kind of steam era uh, of that time. So a lot of times imagery wise, it's kind of dark, it's a little gritty because of all the coal and the soot that's kind of all over the place in these cities. So you can definitely tell it has that aesthetic appeal in the game, which definitely fits and feeds into um, into the game and, and trying to get into it like, oh yeah, I feel like I'm really playing into this this game that has to do with kind of this this time piece, this period, this era. So yeah, so so in that, uh, just to continue kind of talking about components wise, uh, again in the deluxe version that Ben has, it has some really cool pieces. Uh, I, I think the the tiles of the industries are all remain the same, and the artwork on all the cards are the same, and the player mats. But the part that's really cool that they they do differently is primarily the money. So in like mm -hmm. the normal game or like the base game, if you just buy it in stores, it'll be kind of cardboard punch out tokens that you'd utilize. But when you have the deluxe version, they actually use clay uh, poker chips. So they actually created like custom made poker chips. And I think Ben's gonna bring it out. So yeah, yeah, I can bring it. it out while you're talking. Um, but yeah, so, so just in general, if you can ever, so, so this is just my own personal thing, even moving past a little bit of this game is, if you can ever incorporate clay chips into your game, that's just great. It's just awesome because clay chips are just so cool and they're so they're so good. Um, but yes, clay chips, uh, Ben is showing it. And this is very specific to this game. They're made specifically for, I think it's uh, denominations of ones, fives, tens, and twenties uh, for, for use in the game. So that's your money. That's, that's the money that's being tracked. I think uh, because it's England, it's pounds. So it represents one pound, five pounds, 10 pounds, and 20 pounds, uh, mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. again, for the, for the game play. Um, but getting into the game itself, uh, as Ben mentioned, this is a Euro game. So ultimately the point of this game is all about collecting points, but this game really does something kind of, I think different or unique in the Euro style. And there's other games that are kind of similar to this. So if you ever played a game called Power Grid, there's, it, it has a very similar concept in your in, in the fact that you're creating routes to to put together. But in Brass Birmingham, they they really take it up a notch in, in this game. So as we were mentioning, um, the way that the game works or the way that the game plays uh, in your turns. So talking about the player turns is it's a very clean um, what do you call it? Clean execution and how they do it. So basically, every player is going to have a, a series of cards in their hands. And they're either going to be locations on the board or they're going to be specific to the industries that Ben was talking about that you're going to be building throughout the game. And every time you take an action in the game, you have to discard a card from your hand. I, and it's either in relation to the location of the city that you're building into or of the industry that you're going to build or just discarding the card to take the action effect. So uh, in the game, I believe there's six different forms of actions. Uh, we won't go into all of them because it'll take way too long to just explain rules. But effectively, they'll be do doing different things like building the industry locations. You'll be building routes, which is the way in which you connect your you, you connect throughout the different cities uh, within Birmingham or the region of Birmingham that you're connecting together. So then you can build more or you can gather the coal resources or other resources to continue expanding your network. Right, because the industrial era is all about market, right? Mercantile trading and kind of building up these industries. 
Um, then there's also uh, taking out loans, which is very typical of, you know, when you're investing and you're trying to be, you know, a merchant, sometimes you're going to take loans out. So there's the loan activity, then there's scouting, which allows you to get different kinds of cards, uh, and then development, which is very important for upgrading or being able to get into other industries, because you can be locked out. Um, and I think this is actually one of the really cool parts of the game to one of the things that I know Ben warned me of or reminded me of as we started the game is the sense of you're never going to build everything on your player board with all the industry tiles. So as you can see here, even as what Ben was just showing right there, every player has 46 potential industries that they can build. And I think in total, there's only about eight, I think, or 10 turns in a round or eight to 10 turns in an age. So in total, you'll be able to have maybe 20 turns. And that's not assuming that you can't, like that, that's assuming that you would be able to have every single resource, every single time to build. That's highly unlikely. So just know, like, I think that makes for a really interesting part of this game where your strategies are gonna depend very heavily on what you're able to build, the cards you have and what other players are doing because I think that's the other really cool mechanic about this Euro game and what we're talking about with resource collection. So typically in these kinds of Euro games, when we're talking about resource collection, most of the time how that works is you as a player are going to be collecting resources over a period of time that kind of are yours to own and then yours to use up in the course of a game, right? That's just standard, right? In most Euro games. But in Brass Birmingham, they definitely take it to a very different way where the resources are actually in effect shared across the board. So what will happen is as you're playing through the game, uh, Ben is showing it, there'll be these cubes that represent coal or iron. The coal is the black, iron is the, it looks yellowish or orange uh, uh, cubes. And then there's a third resource called a uh, beer uh, that, that will also be on the board, these barrels. Uh, but basically the way that it works is as you're building the industries that create these resources, they will start on the board primarily on the industry tiles. And the way that it works is in, in order to build an industry tile later that utilizes that resource. So for example, if I needed to build something that needed coal, what I would need to do is I would need to be able to be connected by my routes to a coal on the board or in the market in order for me to be able to build. So as you can see here, that little boat in, in in between the cities that that's a canal or in rails in the second age would be how you connect and in order for me to build in like the city redditch let's say for example i would need to have a connection to coal uh in order to build it or sell which maybe i can talk about a little bit later but basically that's kind of the way that resources work so the resources that you take though isn't your own choice uh like it's not like i can choose like oh i'm going to use my own coal to do it what the rule is that you have to use the closest available coal to your location and it could be another player's coal and so basically what will happen is you're taking the coals off of that their resource location and once all of the coal is taken off of it then it in a sense kind of develops or it's like fully utilized and that's when the player would score or will be able to score on that industry tile for that example so in this game, what it's effectively doing is it encourages you to be the one who's creating the resources for other people to use because it allows for you to get points that way. But it's also one of those things that you have to keep doing because there's a lot like the there's effectively only two major resources that are used for building, which is the coal and the iron in the game. So coal is taken as it's part of the routes. Iron has a little bit of a different rule uh, in which you can take it from anywhere on the board. But that's still kind of the same concept is that you take it from these industry tiles on the board. So rather than you as a player collecting these industries over time or collecting resources for your personal hoarding and your personal use, let's say, it's actually a shared collective resource, which is very, very different. But it definitely changes a lot of how you think about these games where it's like, OK, I need resources to build so that I can try to get ahead in points. But by me utilizing a resource that's maybe on the other players, uh, tiles, it's giving them, you know, you're helping them out as you are trying to do what's going to help you out. So there's kind of this constant play of kind of figuring out 
is it be be beneficial for me to help them out in this uh, scenario because I really need to build it? Or can I find maybe a different alternative, but maybe it's going to cost me a lot more and maybe it's not going to be great for me in the long run. So you definitely have to weigh the pros and cons of those kinds of actions and those kinds of decisions, which makes this game very, very interesting. But in addition to that, the, or and in addition to that, it's just the fact that you also have to think about how you're connecting yourselves to the greater network of the city, right? You can't just play solo. If you just play on your own, trying to do your own thing, what will probably end up happening is either you're not going to be able to get enough resources to do what you need, or someone might decide that they see what you're doing and then they'll connect into your network and then take your resources that you you may be trying to utilize or you may be trying to do. So you have to be very careful or you have to think a lot about how you're gonna act and how you're gonna take your turns. Um, yeah, and then um, I think, let's see, uh, in terms of the turn actions, once again, getting back into it, uh, I think it's a very clean way, as I mentioned before, is you effectively have two turns, right? Or two I actions. Think, I think that was something I also mentioned to you before we played that first time, right? Yeah that something I remembered was the card play was the, the, the time track for the game is very clean. It always works out the right amount. Exactly. And, and, and as Ben is saying, exactly in that it's the way that you track how, how long an age lasts is basically by the amount of cards that are played. And if you're playing correctly and you don't make any mess ups, um, by the end of the age, every player will have played every single card in their hand with the exact amount of actions for the turn, right? So, uh, which in effect is about, I think, eight to 10 turns. Well, like every every card in their hand and the deck, right? And the deck, sorry. You're playing uh, hand and, and the deck because at the, end of, at the end of your turns, you would always redraw your hand back to eight until the deck is out of cards. And then what ends up happening is then you just keep playing your cards until you have no more cards in your hand. So mm -hmm. kind of similar to uh, drafting games, if you've ever played those kinds of games where you're playing mm -hmm. cards from your hand one at a time until you're out. So like Sushi Go Party, things like that. You just keep playing until you're out of cards. That also takes the same effect in this game. And that's a very, it's a really great way of actually tracking it because it also means that everybody always has an equal amount of turns in this game, which is really cool. Um, but I also think one of the other things that's really cool about this game is it's not just about the actions in your turn, because maybe you're asking, well, what about turn order? Because turn order is something we've talked about mm -hmm. in many of our videos. This game also really does turn orders in a very cool way too, where in a number of Euro games, when there is an ability or is a, there's a way to change turn order, what typically happens in most of these games is there's some form of a selection of like players being able to select who goes first or has to place a certain like worker marker or some kind of action to indicate that they're gonna go first. But in this game, the way that they do turn order is that at the end of everyone's turn uh, per, uh, per round, um, what'll happen is you'll look at in the bottom left corner as Ben is kind of highlighting for you here is during each player's turn, you're gonna put the amount of money that you're using into next to your player marker indicator here and to just show how much money you had spent within your turn. Uh, and then at the end of all, everyone's turns, you'll see, you'll, you'll look at who spent the most money to who spent the least amount of money. Whoever spent the least amount of money is the one who gets to go first in the next round. And then, you know, it, it goes up until the, uh, the, the last player would be the one who spends the most money. I think typically if there's ties, you keep the turn order in mm -hmm. you know in the best way possible uh, of whoever was ahead they stay ahead mm -hmm. and whoever is behind will uh, or whoever goes later will stay later if there's a tie but that actually is a really cool mechanic because it incentivizes players to do certain actions that don't take money to do in order to try to go first but there's a certain point where you have to be spending money in order to do things so you can you can try to stagger or you can try to stack your turns where you're taking multiple actions you know in a row right so for example if i was going second in a round and i know that let's say in this example here is like ben spent like 20 20 pounds in his turn i go second i can maybe say i'm going to spend 15 pounds in my turn in total and then the next round i immediately go again so in effect i have four actions or four turns in a row to do or, or I have four actions in a row two turns in a row to do the things I want so I can really chain my effect or chain my actions in a very 
you know, if I have a very specific plan and I really want to make sure I'm using my resources or doing something where I wouldn't want Ben to sabotage what I'm trying to do in that example. So it actually makes for a really interesting way of thinking about how you want to go about playing with your money or how you want to go about playing with your turns. And then um, what yes. did you, uh, what did you think about the income? And that is exactly what I was just about to talk and about. So actually, and, ju and just to note, uh, I am showing this picture from the Kickstarter a few years ago, but I think that was when it was still in development. So some of the things are a little different from what it ended up being. So yeah. if you're referencing this, John, just know, mm -hmm. I just noticed like the income and progress track is slightly pushed. It's, in a it's on the different position. side. I think, I think it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, in the, in the official version, it's on the left-hand side of the board, yeah, but, yeah. but this works for the purposes of our image. So the income tracker. So this is actually also something that's pretty not, I don't know if revolutionary is the right word, but definitely very different than most games do income. So typically in games, if you have an income tracker where you can grow or decrease your income, what usually happens is it's just like a one for one stage growth, right? Where it's like, if I gain income, I just gain it in an like increments of however much I grow, or if I lose it, I just lose it in increments of however I lose it. This game actually does it in a, in a very unique way, and it also tracks to their victory point tracker, which is also really nice, right? Because you're kind of utilizing the same tracker multiple times. So as you can see here highlighted on the bottom, uh, you can kind of see two uh, numerical kind of trackers. So the very bottom one is starting from zero and goes up, you know, across the whole board. That's considered the that that's the victory point tracker as well as what's called the progress tracker mm -hmm. so as a victory point tracker just standard victory points that's just how you track the number of points that you have and you'll use i think the hex the the, the hex uh token for your player color to keep track of it the second though is the 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 progress bar also indicates a relationship to income so on the top is the income that you would be gaining every at the start of every turn during your turn. So in this case, you can see it goes all the way from negative 10 and it can go up all the way, I think, to 30 mm -hmm. in this. I don't know if they changed that in the official version, but it mm -hmm. seems like probably like some, some number value. Now, the interesting thing about how income works is that in order to grow in income, you will have another tracker, a circular tracker, and it starts at the number 10 on the kind of the victory point tracker, but we'll call it the progress tracker at mm -hmm. this point. So basically what will happen there is as you're creating uh, different kinds of industries, as you're selling your industries or as your industries are being utilized by other players, you will gain progress. And so what that means is your little circle token will move up the progress tracker according to the number that it increased. So for example, let's say I had a coal mine and the coal mine kind of develops and it says coal mine progress three, let's say. So what would happen is if I started at the 10, I would move up three on the progress tracker, which is one, two, three. So it actually lands me in the income two section. So you can already see right there, three is not two. That's a different number. That's a discrepancy, but that's how they do the tracking in this game for income. So at the end of my turn and at the start of my next turn, if I stayed there, I would gain two, two pounds at the start of that turn and you know, consequently continue. So as you can see here on this board, if you go kind of further down the line, once you hit like income 11, you'll notice that the progress tracker actually starts growing in the number of, uh, the number of progress movements you need to make in order to get to a higher income bracket, right? So that encourages you to make more progress, but your progress isn't gonna net you as much you know, income growth right away. It's going to take more and more industry. It's going to take more and more for you to get there. Now, the other interesting part about income tracker is, as I mentioned, one of the actions in turn is loaning. So when you take a loan out, what happens is you automatically get a set number of pounds in your hand or for yourself. So I, I believe it's 30 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, but what happens is then you will, your you move your progress tracker down three income levels at the highest level of the low uh, of that income level that you just dropped down to. So in the in the case if we just started the game and I took out a loan, it's pretty standard, right? I, I start at zero income, I drop down to minus three. So it just that seems pretty obvious. And then it wouldn't take that much progress to get myself back up to zero or one, right? But let's say in the example that I had, let's say I had like five income, right? If I were to take a loan out when I had five income, 
I wouldn't drop three on the progress tracker. I would actually drop three on my income. So I'd take five minus three is two. So my progress tracker would actually go to the two section on the highest spot, which is very different than most games and how it works, right? So that's the 14, I think, on the top. Mm -hmm. So in order for me to get back to five, uh, five income, it wouldn't just be I need three progress to get myself back. That would only get me to four. I would need five progress in total to get me back to the five space. So as you can see, as you get higher and higher into the income brackets, if you start taking loans out, it's a lot more impactful and it's a lot more painful in order for you to get back up to a good amount of income in your game. So it's, it's a really cool concept. I actually hope that in the future that this kind of income tracking or resource collection can be something that can be added into games in the future. I think it definitely throws a different kind of wrench in Euro style games of the kind of engine building that you'd like to do or the resource management or resource collection. And it changes the way the scaling works where typically what if players are getting kind of ahead in these kinds of games, they tend to kind of skyrocket or they'll snowball their effects of, of victory because they're just getting more than other players. But in this game, the cool thing is that it scales it off a little bit where it, even if someone's kind of pulling ahead really fast early on, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's impossible to catch up with them because they're not going to keep being able to get like an insane amount of income really fast. Or, if, you know, they push it really hard, but they may need to take a loan out, then it'll cause them more detriments where if you may take it a little slower, it might take you a little bit more to catch up, but at least you do have an opportunity to catch up in that way. So I think that's a really great way of balancing this game or balancing this concept out. And then I don't, I don't know what your next point you have noted, but a couple of things that come to mind are if you yes. had any thoughts on the actual cards, mm -hmm. the card play and like the wild cards, anything with the cards basically. yeah uh I, I mean i i feel like the cards are pretty like they're really pretty <laughs> in the first place uh as i was mentioning earlier about components um i think it's a really cool concept uh it does take a little bit to get used to uh in the game in the sense that the, the there's two different kinds of cards as was mentioned there's location cards specific to the locations and then there is the industry cards which are specific to industry types that you can utilize to build in any location if it has that industry, right? And you're connected, right? That's the other thing that's really important to the game. So in order to use these industry specific cards, your network needs to be connected. So you would need a canal or a train to connect to that particular city that's yours. It can't be someone else's, it has to be yours. But if you have the location card, so for example, in this, uh, in this board that Ben is sharing, if I had the card Walsall, if I had that card, I could build in one of those two square locations, provided that I have the resources to build it, whether it just costs money or it needs a coal that's connected, whether it's my coal or somebody else's coal, as we mentioned before, or maybe an iron to build it. It just, as long as you have one of those components or as long as you have the resources and you have the money to do it, then you could just build right away in it. It doesn't have to be connected to your network. It doesn't, so, so that's a way that you can kind of create different nodes across the board in different spaces that maybe you don't have an initial connection to, or maybe you don't have a quick access to certain kinds of resources yourself, but you know that your opponent players do. So that's a way that you can kind of utilize their resources to your advantage, because then you get to build your own thing, but it also supports them, as we mentioned before. Uh, but I think it's a really cool concept. Uh, Again, it does, it does take getting used to. Uh, there is a certain amount of each of the cards, as we mentioned, but you play through the whole deck. So there's all the cards will go through. Um, and then the nice thing is that there is an action, which I kind of skimmed over, that allows you to get wild cards. So basically what will happen is you get rid of three cards from your hand in total, and you'll be able to pick up two wild cards to replace the cards that you got rid of. So that's basically how that action works. And the wild cards count for there's two different types. There's one wild card that is any location. So basically it counts as any location card in the game. And then the other one is the uh, industry wild card, which means it counts for any industry in the game that you can build. So you can utilize it for that. Uh, I, I think it's a really cool power because it allows you to do something with your turn that maybe you originally were kind of locked out based on the cards that you draw. So it gives you an out for being able to do different things. Uh, it's also a good way of not passing a turn entirely because 
turn efficiency is very important in this game. And sometimes maybe you don't feel like you have a good hand and you, maybe you don't want to spend money right away, like for your turn, because maybe you want to go first. Utilizing this action allows you to do something that will be beneficial for you while kind of skipping your turn or for a round or for, or for, for an, uh, skipping for an action. So you don't have to kind of maybe jeopardize your turn order for that. Um, yeah. So actually, and not necessarily going in like pro con order as we usually do, but something that I'm guessing might be a con. I mean, I might be wrong, but uh, when you were mentioning the whole uh, building with the cards, building your industry on a location or yes. uh, using an industry card, it, you know, it has to be in your network. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was teaching this game, that was something I mentioned a few different points, right? Of like, we both needed the clarification from the rules yeah. of like, okay, there's connected and there's in your network. Yes. And then there's like a location card that then doesn't have to be either. Um, it, I don't know, was that was that troubling at all for you? Yeah, so, so, so as we're kind of deep into this first impressions and it's already taking a while, uh, you can tell there's a lot of stuff going on in this game, right? The difficulty of this game is the, or one of the things that I found kind of annoying or frustrating about the game is the fact that there is a lot of these nuances to your rules and to the actions that you're taking. So every single action, every single movement, every single utilization of resources all have like little rules that are technically all interconnected, but they have their own version or their own nuance. So in, in talking about resources for building, let's say, for example, so talking about coal, um, in the, uh, iron and beer. Mm -hmm. All three of them have three different ways in how they're utilized. So the first one is, the, or I'll go with the simplest one first, which is iron. Iron is the simplest because as long as there's iron that exists on the board, anyone uses it regardless of whether it's connected to anything or not. You just get to use iron on the board. That's it. Simplest explanation doesn't have anything complicated with network, doesn't have anything complicated with being connected to your grid or to your, uh, to your pathways or just connected at all. It's just, you just build with it, you just utilize it. Then the next complicated, the next most complicated one I would say is the beer next. So the way that the beer works is twofold. There's two rules. So the first rule is if you own the beer, so if you built a brewery that creates beer, you are allowed to use that beer like an iron, basically. You can just use it anywhere. It doesn't have to be connected to anything. You just get to utilize it and consume it for whatever you're going to do in your action. Then the <laughs> other rule about using beer is if there's a beer that you want to use on the board, it must be connected to the location that you're building at is what, it, what you need to do, right? So for it, like in this map example, in, in kind of the if you see like the beer barrel sections on the board that basically if you were going to use that beer whatever you're going to build or whatever you're going to sell or whatever's going to use that beer has to have canals or railroads that connect it to the location that it's going it doesn't have to be your own but it has to be connected in some way okay and that can and then that can consume either your beer or other people's beers as well. You can steal other people's beers that way. So then that's beer. So then the most complicated one, in my opinion, is the coal. So coal is super complicated in this game. It's the most important one because it's the one you use the most in this game, but to me, it's also the most complicated one. So, the, okay, so the way that coal works is, one, if you build a coal mine, it creates the coal on the coal mine selection area, right? Then there's, a rule involved with that. If that coal is connected to the coal markets, what will happen is any coal, uh, any coal that's on that um, that coal tile automatically gets sent to the market to be sold, right? And so on the on the far right of it, or yeah, on the far right of the board, on the left hand side, that's where you track. You put the cubes onto that spot based on how much you know, how many spaces are left, and then based on the numbers or based on the location in which you're placing those cubes, you as the player will gain that money. So if you place it on the two and the one in the one section, you gain four gold, or you gain four, not gold, you gain four pounds in total, right? So on and so forth. So that, that's if your coal mine is connected. If your coal mine is not connected to the network or to the market, it doesn't get sold. It just stays in the coal because it's not connected to the market. And even if you connect it afterward, 
it doesn't just automatically get sold at that point. It's only when you first place it. Then the coal at that point follows the rules of the beer in the way it's connected. So in order to use coal at that point, or when you're building something, whatever you're building has to be connected to a coal source. And the coal source can either be the coal mines themselves, or it can be the coal market, or I think it's called the distant market in the game, but it's the coal market in the game. So in order for you to actually be able to build it, it has to, at the end of your payments of it, connected. So for example, a canal, as long as a canal builds into a source of coal, then you're fine, right? Or a railroad, I think, a railroad, which is the second age. Um, but it has to be connected. And the other additional rule is you must use coal on the board before you can use coal from the market if you're connected. So whatever is the closest coal, you have to use that. Same thing with iron. You have to use the iron on the board before you can buy iron from the market. But if you need to buy it from there, you can't. So that's how those work. It's, it, if you play the game enough or you play the game after a while, it does start making sense, but it's still a very odd rule uh, it, or not odd rule, but it takes some getting used to because the whole concept of it is that's for just tracking the resources that you're building. Because when we were talking about the cards part, and I think this is where Ben was kind of alluding into it, is in order for you to build buildings, as I was mentioning, if you're building a location, it doesn't have to be connected to your network as long as you use the location card to build the location and it has the resource. But if you're building a canal or you're building with an industry card, that building that you're building must be connected to your network, but then also connected to the resources in some way. Right. So it, that itself also has an additional layer of rules where you have to keep track, not just of the connection to resources, you have to, you have to determine whether it's actually connected to your network, actually your specific network, your colors, which can be confusing in the game. So that's my two cents on it. Uh, I think <laughs> I went a little bit really into detail, but I think it's actually really important because it is a very confusing, it can be a very confusing rule, especially as your first time playing through the game or your first couple times playing through. And my first impression, I think the entire game when Ben and I were playing, I was basically asking the question every time I tried to build or I had to be, or I had to be checked because I realized like there were times where I accidentally, I did something that I wasn't allowed, like that properly following the rules I'm not allowed to do. Mm. so yeah very confusing i think it's a uh, it's kind of a pain to, to keep <laughs> track of and they all have their own way of utilization it's a little arbitrary especially for the beer i think the the beer rules it, it, it's a combination of the iron and the coal rules so it's it but but it kind of conceptually or thematically i did get thrown off by it a lot because it just didn't really feel like it was like why is beer just like whatever you know it's just so like random like i can just take it from anywhere that seems <laughs> odd whatever right because yeah, like beers, you would think everywhere. in you would think in a game that has to do with kind of routing and creating routes or creating connections that resources should generally work that way about being routed or being connected in some capacity in some way but it does especially with iron and coal or when the iron works the way that beer works it kind of throws you off because then it's like wait does coal doesn't work that way either so then it's kind of tracking all of them and trying to remember and like almost every single building as ben is showing here all your industries they all take different kinds of resources at all the different levels and then it's not just building them some of them you actually have to sell them and selling them takes a resource sometimes and so you have to be connected in that way and so, so it's, it's a very it can be very confusing for for people when, when you're just trying to learn it. Because again, it's the idea that it's not your resources, it's resources on the map. And those are limited and they'll change very frequently throughout your game, so. And so then, I don't know, did you did you have other pros and cons? I didn't know if you had anything to say about any thoughts on the actual like development action or even just the flipping of the tiles or the, the scoring at the end of each, both eras? Well, I, I wasn't going to say too much. I feel like they're all pretty standard for the most part, for, for most players. Uh, the, uh, maybe the only thing I'll say about development, I do think, I, I like how they incorporated development into the game and it encourages the use of iron in the game because iron otherwise is pretty non-useful 
throughout this game. Because uh, as you can see here, even on the board, there's not that many buildings that actually require a lot of iron to build. Mm -hmm. But the development action, which I didn't explain, is basically uh, you, you can use up iron on the board, up to two iron per action you take of developing. And what it'll do is it'll actually remove industry tiles from your board. So the cool thing about that is, as we were mentioning, there's going to be so many tiles, you're never going to be able to build everything. But what the removal of the tiles does is it allows you to then build the next level of the industry because you always have to build from the lowest industry first into the higher ones. So if you're able to remove them out of the way, it'll allow you to then build these higher level kind of structures, which typically typically are worth more points overall in the game. Not always, there's some exceptions, but generally that's the case. So usually you wanna have higher industry. The other interesting thing is if you can see on the board, there's a little blue kind of ribbon next to some of them with like a half moon. What that actually indicates is that these are buildings or industries that can only be built during the canal era of the game. So you can only build them in the first era until you kind of use up all the cards in the deck and you move into the second era. Once you move into the second era, what happens is you can no longer build those buildings, but the industry tiles stay on your board. You don't get rid of the industry tiles from there, they stay on there. So for example, the iron one that Ben is highlighting right now, if I had an iron, if I had an iron uh, tile there, I can no longer build iron buildings until I remove that. So the development action allows you to remove that tile from it. So it gives me the ability to then build iron in the next age, in the, in the, in the, the, uh, the rail era, which is really cool, right? Because it actually, it encourages you to look at what you're doing. And if you are thinking about, oh, maybe I do need to get into coal, or maybe I need to get into iron, or maybe I'm going to start doing manufactured goods, you realize, oh, in order for me to do that, I need to take at least a turn to get rid of it. Or you can also do the other thing of like, maybe in the first era, you realize my late game strategy or my later strategies, I'm going to try to build these really big buildings or these really high industries, but I need to set myself up to be able to get to them in, in the first place. So let me start removing a bunch of them early on. And maybe I'm helping somebody because I'm getting rid of either iron, but that means that it's giving me the advantage or maybe the potential advantage in the later part of the game where it allows me to then really scale up and get a lot of points or, you know, whatever you're going to do. So, so I think it's really cool. It, it, in, in that sense, development gives you an additional, uh, also the same idea of an additional action that doesn't take money. So you can kind of keep your turn or try to kind of push yourself to get an earlier turn so that you're not, you know, going last all the time or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, and then it also gives you options for the future for, for things you might want to do. Um, there are certain cards that can't be um, developed. I think the pottery is the specific one, I think is the only one. They have a little anti-light bulb, which means that you can't use the development action on that. You have to build those in order to get past them. But pottery is also the exception that it doesn't have an era blocker. You can always build them at, in, in any era. So yeah, and then... So yeah any 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 final final thoughts final... yeah i was i was gonna say overall this is this is a really good game i think it's a really solid solid game and i think any reviewers that talk about this game will tell you the same thing my personal hopes is i would like to play this game with multiple like multiple times because i think there's a lot of different strategies that even after our first playthrough together we were talking for a good 30 minutes after of like the, diff the different potential things that could happen in a game of ways of scoring points or different ways of maybe playing like a low income game, but trying to get a high yield of kind of different kinds of manufactured goods. Cause you're just, you're not trying to build a lot of, you're not trying to grow your progress tracker, but you're spending a lot doing sales or, or that kind of thing, which may be a potential or, or like kind of like sapping off of other people's resources in that way. So that's one thing we talked about. Um, there's uh, other things of just like having more players because I've only played it with between Ben and myself. So it's only a two player game. I would be interested in seeing what changes when you have more players on the board, which generally would mean more resources on the board or more opportunities for expansion or kind of moving around the board or building your locations on the board. Uh, that would be cool. Um, one little word of warning for players is this game is very prone to action, or analysis paralysis uh, or you know alpha gamers or, or uh, min-maxing gaming where if did, people did take a long like time Did you feel like you were thinking, doing that? You were uh, doing that, weren't you, when we were I playing was. this? I, there, there was that one point where we were supposed to eat dinner. I was in the middle of that <laughs> process and 
<laughs> it was disrupted, but we needed to eat. At the, uh, <laughs> yeah, at the with positivity me. of my wife's great cooking was it, was for us. Looking at me or Erica while he we were yes, eating yes. dinner, and he just and I was like, thinking throughout I the dinner of what my action would be. Um, but yeah, so so it can be pretty intensive in that way. So just be warned about that. The game can take longer than an hour to two hours if you have multiple people who play that way. Um, but I also think that it is a game that sometimes it's actually encouraged not to think too much into the future about your turn too far ahead, because especially if you play with more players, because a lot of the resources that you might want to utilize might be gone also. Mm. There is a certain kind of concept of like, maybe it's not the best interest to try to spend so much time trying to min-max this exact action because, you know, maybe it'll only net you that far. But then, of course, anyone who's an alpha gamer or min-maxer is like, well, that one extra point wouldn't be the thing that makes me get a victory. But so I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I mean, just generally, that, you know. that is a good point, though. Like, the, the that, that, that way that things can change pretty quickly, yes. right? Of like, I, you could plan ahead of like, okay, if I... Have the, if I build this coal, then I can use it for this, or or I can hope that someone builds coal so I can do this. But you know, any of those outcomes could not happen, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Otherwise, that that's kind of my thought. Uh, I really was. I, I think it's the turns and the way that resource management was done is what really kind of makes this game a more unique than any other, or like more special than other games that do similar things. So, as I mentioned, if you want a lighter game than Brass that's similar with this route building or this concept of routing. Uh, Power Grid is another game. It's an older game as well, um, but that is also a good game for at least understanding how routing works in games and how you can kind of, this, this concept of taking routes as well as kind of taking uh, spots in the nodes of the routes, right? And kind of encouraging that concept of how you think about it. So if you're interested in a different kind of game like that, I would recommend Power Grid as another one to maybe start off with before you jump headfirst into Brass. But Brass is also, surprisingly for the nuances and the rules and all that, it actually isn't that crazy to learn in, in reality. The turns are pretty straightforward. So despite everything I talked about there, <laughs> it's, it is, because it is a Euro game, it is surprisingly kind of, I would almost say light in the amount of actions that you can take it for, for a Euro style game. There's only effectively kind of six major actions. And even of the six major actions, you're probably only taking three or four of them most of the time. And then a couple of them are almost never used or only used in very special circumstances. So yeah. But yeah, that's my first impression. Okay. So those are John's first impressions. Again, I am An hour long. not <laughs> here sharing my thoughts yet, really. Uh, but know that Brass Birmingham also is very high up there on the top games of all time lists. I think it has dropped games. though in time. It's huh? not in like the top top anymore like it used to be. Uh I mean I'm not gonna say here. <laughs> I will I will say it was in, in the top our actual review or you can look it up on board game geek yourself if you guys are curious yeah. how high up it is there for the community. Uh but that was John's first impressions of Brass Birmingham. And yes we're both looking forward to hopefully getting to try it again sometime. Mm -hmm. and in the near future and so if you found this helpful interesting i hope you'll actually uh look into maybe even other videos like uh how to play videos on like the full rules so you can see how that goes oh never mind i was like at the hotness track never mind <laughs> my bad um uh or we wait for our review video of this game and so uh hope you'll share this with friends family people you play board games with Hope you'll consider subscribing to this channel and following us at I Got Board Game on Instagram. And until next game. time, we'll see you then. Bye. Bye.